the whole time. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to, to our workshop on the multiple phases of quantum proof. I wrote down a few points to, as an open remark. Um, so first of all, this is a joint effort uh, with an uh, uh, organization by Alessandro Chiesa, Tom Poor, Dakshita Kurana, and Thomas Vidic, who unfortunately, for, for uh, various reasons, couldn't make it physically, but most of them will be online. Um, right, so, so the idea of this workshop is to really, really try to cover all uh, 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 recent advancements of uh, quantum proofs, and in particular, uh, um, we would like to sort of uh, um, uh, 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 really, really focus on the intersection between, um, between uh, quantum and cryptography. And uh, all the talks that the speakers have gracefully agreed to prepare are going to be sort of tutorial style talks. And uh, you know, the idea of this workshop is that you come here and you sit through the talks and um, at the end of the day you sort of get enough, uh, get enough material and get enough intuition to sort of start doing the research by yourself and sort of, you should have all the, all the, all the background in order to, to like, read the most recent research papers. Um, yeah, so with that, that out of the way, um, I, oh, I should thank Casa, the sponsor of, of this workshop, and outside you can find some merchandise, please grab it. Um, yeah, so with that out of the way, uh, let me introduce the first speaker of today, which is going to be Seth, uh, Seth Garibian and he's going to give a gentle introduction to quantum proof. This is really the first, the first uh, talk of this workshop. We're all very excited to hear what you have to say, Seb. Please, take it away. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this is supposed to be a very, um, well, mostly an introductory talk. Okay, it's, it's meant to be for an audience. Like, you don't need to have background in quantum. Um, let me give the standard disclaimer. Um, there are many things I don't know in life, and one of them is how long this talk is gonna take. So my goal is not to finish the talk. My goal is for you to leave here having learned something, okay? So uh, I really encourage you to stop me at any time. Let's do this like a game. Like I'm trying to teach you something. You're trying to ask me questions and make me look stupid, okay? The, the, think of it that way, okay? So it should be very interactive. Um, and yeah, to get you guys to do research within, at the end of the workshop, I think that's a tall order for us to meet, but I guess we'll aim for that, okay? Good, so let's begin again. Stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, so I was always taught as a computer scientist, and that is my background, just so you know, is that you know, whenever you write code, you always have your preconditions on top of the code, what you're expecting from the person using the code, and then when you exit the code, you know, what are the post conditions that ho should hold true, right? So um, preconditions are, I'm expecting some background in quantum complexity theory and some linear algebra. If you don't have these, you don't need to freak out and go running out of the room, but you know, this is kind of what I'll take, okay? 
And what you should hopefully have leaving this is what you see on this uh, table of contents. Okay, so like I said, I'm not gonna assume any background on quantum computing, so I'll give you a little bit of a crash course in the beginning, just a few slides. Uh, then I'll tell you about the basics like quantum P and NP. Um, I'll spend some time going over this uh, kind of classic quantum Cook-Levin theorem. And last but not least here, I'll, I'll talk about the different flavors of quantum NP and some more recent things, let's say. Okay, so the first three quarters of it are really review and the, the last part, you know, there'll be a mix of review and new stuff. Okay? Any questions before we start? Okay, good. So let's begin. Um, like I said, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, quantum mechanics and what you're going to need. So, you know, for this talk and for all the talks in this workshop, um, a quantum state on n qubits, um, it's going to be good enough to just think of it as a unit vector. Okay? Any unit vector will do. The, the key point is just that uh, the dimension of our space is 2 to the power n. Okay? Uh, this bad boy over here. So the space grows exponentially in the number of qubits. You can't write this thing down classically. Um, what we normally like to do is, you know, you can take your quantum state and expand it in your favorite basis of choice. Typically, we think of the standard basis, right, where these are just a set of n-bit strings. And these amplitudes over here, it's got to be normalized, so they sum in squared to 1. Okay, so what are we allowed to do in terms of operations on qubits? Um, what quantum mechanics tells us is that we can do an arbitrary unitary map. That means from n qubits to n qubits. And the main thing um, that's required, what does it mean to be unitary? It means that this uh, u dagger u equals to identity. I mean, if, if you don't, that makes no sense to you, that's fine. All this really means is that, you know, my quantum states are unit vectors in space. And what quantum mechanics says I can do is I can just rotate these. Okay, so think of the unit hypersphere. I could just rotate the unit hypersphere. So these are all um, length preserving and reversible operations. Okay? Good. And of course, the, the key caveat is that we cannot implement arbitrary unitaries in poly n time. Okay? Now, um, we're computer scientists here, right? And so now you should be getting upset at me and say, you know, what does poly n time even mean? Okay, what's our computation model? Right? So for this talk, and I think for most sane computer scientists in quantum, we tend to work in the circuit model, right? Um, and so what that means is that typically we want some sort of polynomial size quantum circuit. And, you know, you start with some number of input wires, let's say all initialized to zero. You run some number of gates. I mean, don't worry if you don't know what these gates are doing. But they're quantum gates, basically. They're just unitaries. They might act on one qubit or two qubits. And out comes some quantum state on all n qubits. Okay? Questions so far? Good. Good. So um, if all we could do is unitaries, um, that would be kind of useless because at the end of the day, we need to read out some information from our system, right? Classically, we take this completely for granted. Quantumly, it's actually a very key part of the picture. And so we have to do a so-called measurement. And I won't go into the full theory of this, of course. But the basic premise is that if I have a state expanded in the standard basis, and I do a measurement in the standard basis, then you know, basically I get outcome x with probability you know, the weight squared. Okay, So if x has a large weight on it, then I'm very likely to see that outcome. And Without lots of generality, I mean, you can actually model everything as a standard basis measurement in quantum computing. Okay, so this is without loss of generality. But more generally, something you might see in the later talks, so that's why I'm putting this here, is you could have a general measurement, which has some set of um, pairwise orthogonal projectors. Okay, that's sum to one. So these are all just projectors, and they project you into like orthogonal subspaces, basically. They partition the space. And the formulas are as follows. You know, the probability of seeing some outcome given some input state, is this basically this overlap between this projector and the state you're measuring. Okay, and intuitively that makes sense, right? If my state lives in the support of this projector, then I should really see probability one of projecting onto that subspace. And so now we hit a very quantum phenomenon, which is that when I measure something, right, um, and I see an outcome, then my quantum state collapses to match that outcome. Okay, it kind of uh, decoheres, if you will. And so we project our state psi down onto some subspace, and we have to renormalize because now we've potentially killed off part of the state. Okay, so this is all the basic quantum mechanics I want to give you. We've got quantum states are um, unit vectors. Quantum operations are just rotations of the hypersphere. You could just rotate your unit vectors. And measurements are just, you know, you, you see outcome x with probability alpha x squared. And then we project down onto whatever measurement outcome we saw. Okay? Questions? Okay, um, 
So maybe before we continue, I should take a moment to answer this question, right? Which is, why unitary operators? Like, where does this come from? Right? Okay. So um, I'm going to scare you with a little bit of physics, and um, this will come back to haunt you later in the talk. I'm warning you now. But you know, I'll keep it hopefully light. But it's going to be important. Okay. Um, so where does this unitary business come from? Well, it comes from this so-called Schrodinger equation, which uh, Schrodinger derived in 1935. And basically what it says is that if I have an n-qubit quantum system, then it's evolution in time. Like if I want to know its rate of change with respect to time, it's always governed by some so-called Hermitian matrix um, called the Hamiltonian. So there's some matrix H. It's just essentially a symmetric matrix. It's exponentially large. And you know, here's some first order differential equation. You know, we're computer scientists, we don't like this, so you can ignore it because you can solve this to get something nicer, right? So if you start, um, if you want to see what happens to your state at time t, um, well, I'm missing the initial state here, that's a typo, but you basically hit your initial state with this operator, and then you'll get what happens after time t, okay? And so all operators of this form, if I exponentiate some Hermitian matrix, you get exactly the class of unitary operators. Okay, so that's where this unitarity is coming from. Now, how many people know what it means to exponentiate a matrix? Good, most of you. So then I'll go through this very quickly. An operator function, what in the world does this even mean? Uh, this just means that you, in this case, we can just take the Taylor series expansion for the usual e to the x, plug in the matrix m instead, and that's literally the operator you get. Um, operationally, what this is doing is it applies this um, real valued function to the eigenvalues of your matrix m, okay? Good. So now, now that's really all the background I'm going to give you. So any questions at this point? I'll go move into content now. Good. How many people have a background in quantum computing, by the way? Uh, okay, about half. Okay, good. All right, so we're supposed to be happy at this point. Okay, the basics, BQP, and QMA. So one thing I really want to get out of the way, because, I mean, I remember once I got into this heated debate with Ilya Volkovich about... Um, a misunderstanding between the classical and quantum community, which is, you know, in the classical community, you tend to distinguish between things like BPP and promise BPP, okay? The, the decision class and the promise class. In quantum, everything is a promise class, okay? It's, otherwise, it's really not very well defined for us, okay? So everything I'm going to write down is a promise class, even though I will not write promise BPP, okay? Uh, this is supposed to be a chipmunk that's caught in the act of hoarding its food. Okay, so here's basically my one slide definition of BQP, bounded error, quantum polynomial time. Okay, um, and again, this is supposed to be promised BQP, and you know, ask me any questions if you have, basically. Uh, a promise problem is in BQP basically if there's a, a uniformly generated poly time family of quantum circuits, okay, um, such that the following holds. So here's my circuit family, right? Um, and here's my input X. So if x is a yes case, then, you know, when I run this circuit and I measure at the end, this thing should accept a probability at least two-thirds, okay? And if I'm in the no case, then when I do this measurement, I should accept a probability at most a third. Uh, this here is my workspace. That's what we call the ancilla, okay? Um, and this is supposed to be a poly size circuit because it's generated by a, a p-uniform um, Turing machine, okay? Good, and um, I always like to stress... Um, that there's also an invalid case, of course. It's a promise problem. So if you give me an invalid input, then you know, this thing can do whatever the hell it wants. Okay? Um, questions for this definition? Yeah. Uh, so why does it pass to not have any sort of avoid the promise if you use your NCLA in any case? Oh. Okay, so first question is why, um, you know, why do we have the promise, I suppose? Why is it important for us? Yeah, because um, typically, you know, we need to have an inverse polynomial gap between these two thresholds. Otherwise, we have no hope of verifying this with a quantum computer in any sense. Like quantum computers, uh, think of them as big sampling machines, right? I mean, so you run it, you run it, you run it, and then maybe you take a, some sort of majority vote or something. And so you're not going to get better than one over poly precision in poly time additive error. Um, the second one, uh, why is this here? Well, number one, this is the ancilla, so it's supposed to be a polynomial size kind of workspace. I was too lazy to write it out, so I did it this way. Yeah. Is that a fire alarm? Should we be? All right. Just checking. Okay, good. Um, yeah, go ahead.
Um, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, at this level, you don't need to have it, of course. Okay. Um, I mean, the recent work I've been doing, this, this becomes really important. Like when you start making Oracle queries to like a BQP box, and then, uh, you know, you're, let's say you're a P machine, you're making a query to this promise Oracle. You have no idea if the query you're making is valid or not, and then you have to be very careful that you handle these invalid cases. And I mean, Sandy's gonna talk about some work on this on uh, Wednesday or Thursday? On Wednesday, for example. And they're, I mean, they're, you know, they're not able to resolve the exact complexity of something precisely because of this issue. It's, it's very difficult, right? Although it's a really nice work, don't, uh, but you know, it's very hard to deal with this bloody uh, bad case, right? Yeah. But you still just say that if you don't run these other cases, you still get complexity Sure, sure, yeah. So even if you, just to repeat so, so it's in the mic, um, even if you don't allow the invalid case, you'd still get a superset of DPP. That's absolutely right. Which includes factoring. Which includes factoring, okay. I, that was not known to me, so now it is. Good. I mean, factoring is a decision problem. Good. Um, some of you may have heard there's this very famous um, HHL algorithm. I'd, I'd argue that this has entered the ranks of you know, Grover's algorithm and the factoring algorithm. Um, especially a lot of the QML, quantum machine learning stuff, uses this algorithm. This algorithm basically solves this matrix inversion problem, which is BQP complete. Okay? Uh, I won't say more about that. Good, so this is a promise BQP or just BQP. Um, and now I'll tell you about quantum Merlin Arthur, and uh, this is quantum NP basically. And it's the same definition except what you see in red. Okay, that's what changes. So the only difference now is that um, in the yes case there is a proof, and here we're talking about an n qubit or poly n qubit quantum proof. Okay, here it is. And so then in the yes case there is a good quantum proof that's accepted with high probability, say two thirds. In the no case, no matter which proof I plug in, um, I'm going to accept the probability at most one third. Okay, it's exactly what you expect. Okay, questions? Yeah? Yeah. So it's very important here that this proof is some arbitrary poly n qubit state. It could be extremely complicated. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry? Oh, what's the question? Ah, what, there's an online question? Oh, yeah. They can. <laughs> I see it's a meta question. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can ask questions, just don't ask questions about asking questions, about asking questions. <laughs> don't recurse this idea. Um, good. So if there's a question, though, you should ask it. Good. So this is QMA. Um, now, what do I want to tell you about QMA in this part, right? Um, error reduction, right? Typically, we take this two-thirds, one-third, and we like to amplify it, right? So you can do the obvious type, just like parallel repetition. Give me n copies of the proof in parallel, and I'll take a majority vote. This does work. Quantumly, you have to be a little bit careful because in the no case, when I give you, you know, n copies of a state, I'm not guaranteed that the, the, the proof I get is in the so-called tensor product form, right? I could have some ugly entangled mess across these registers, but there's a way to formalize this. Like, don't worry, it's not difficult to get around that. Um, and then, of course, you get the, the desired uh, kind of exponential separation, let's say, between completeness soundness parameters. Okay, so the weak type of error reduction goes through pretty easily. Um, of course, the problem with this is that it, it blows up the proof size, okay, because I need many copies of the state. And a natural question is, can we do this reduction with just one copy of the state, okay? And a priori, you know, this seems a little bit impossible because, I mean, the no cloning theorem tells me that if you give me kind of one copy of the state, I can't create multiple copies, okay? And as soon as I measure it, I'm going to destroy it. Okay, but turns out this year Christmas comes early because um, there is a way to do this. And it's actually going to be probably going to be important for the uh, zero knowledge talks in this workshop later. There's this notion of quantum rewinding, and it's based on this idea of a Marion Watrous. And on this slide, I'm just going to tell you how the algorithm works. You know, we won't go into the analysis, but it'll give you an idea of how in the world you do this. So the idea is that it's going to be an iterative algorithm. Okay, and what you do is this really stupid looking procedure. Okay. The first thing you do is you run your verification forwards. Like, you're given a proof, right? So you run the verifier QN, and then you measure the output, and whatever the answer is, it's some bit, you store that bit. Okay? You update your counter. And now, what can you do? Well, honestly, not much. The only other thing you could do is just run the verifier backwards. I mean, what, yeah, this is the only circuit you know, right? So run QN in reverse, so that's this dagger here. 
And what can you do? Well, think of it this way, right? Imagine I had a circuit which perfectly accepted its input and its proof. So when I run forwards and I measure, I should get exactly the bit one because it accepted. And when I invert this thing, it should perfectly reset back to my input state. It should go back to uh, my proof and, and still is all zero. And so that's what we're going to check. We're going to see if um, we reset back to the input and the ancilla is being all zero. And if that's true, then again, we set the bit to one. Otherwise, we set the bit to zero and we update the counter. Okay, and what we do at the end is this. And so let me pause on this for a second and let's see the intuition here, right? If we're in the case of perfect completeness, there's a good proof that's acceptable with probability one. What should happen here is what? Every time I go forwards and I measure, I should get one with probability one. So yi will be one. Every time I invert and check that I've reset everything properly, I should see the original state with probability one. So I'll get yi equals one. So all the subsequent bits, yi, will be exactly the same. They'll be one every single time. And the only time you expect to deviate from that pattern in some sense is when uh, the proof you gave me is kind of far from accepting. And then all hell should break loose in some sense when I do this backwards forwards thing. Okay? And that's exactly, if you go through the analysis, um, you just need to check that the number of times the subsequent indices match is at least the majority of the runs. Yeah. So yeah. There, there is a question from the chat. Yeah. Uh, so Tianqi Yang asks, is the P uniformity essential? Say, will the class BQP be different if we replace by it by log space uniform? Uh, by log space uniform? Um, I assume it's essential, but I don't exactly know the answer to that question. I don't know if Ronald might know better than that. Yeah. So. Um, but it is important to have some sort of bound, right? We want it to be a uniform class. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So when we measure this, Right? I don't get a pure state anymore. There's some mixture, right? And then we collapse onto some output, whatever we measure. That's some pure state, and you run the reverse on that. So always remember the ideal case. In the ideal case, there should be absolutely no disturbance when you measure. Like when it's completeness one and you give me a good proof, I will have a pure state after the measurement because I'll accept the probability one. And then everything will make sense. You'll just keep going back and forth. So I, I always like to think of this as like a spinning top in some sense. Like if you have a perfectly spinning top and you keep spinning it, it'll just keep going. But if it started with a wobble, if it wasn't a good top, you know, this thing's gonna, just going to crash, right? And, and that's the idea in some sense, yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll work for two-thirds, one-third. And it'll, it'll, yeah, you don't have to have perfect completeness. Well, you can do the parallel repetition as well to get the amplification. It's just that this one doesn't blow up the proof size. You only need one copy of the proof, which is a bit counterintuitive. And that it's also going to be important when you talk about things like zero knowledge and you need to start rewinding uh, protocols for security proofs. Yeah? Good questions. You guys have failed to make me look stupid so far. Come on, you've got to try harder. OK. Um, good. Um, so what can I tell you about bounds so far? OK, so here's the best bounds that I'm aware of, right? Uh, BPP is, of course, contained in BQP. This is, of course, contained in QMA just by definition. The best bound we have on QMA is basically a pair of bounds. Um, the first bound of these, it's essentially PP. It's slightly stronger. Um, it's basically PP, but where you have a constant multiplicative gap between the soundness and completeness. Um, I'm only aware of this class being studied in the quantum setting, so I don't know what that tells you, but it's believed this is smaller than PP itself. The other class you get as an upper bound is kind of trivially contains it. It's basically when you have a P machine that makes a log number of queries to accumulate Oracle. And this is why I was saying earlier, it's very important that you are clear here that this is a promise class because now when you make queries to this a black box, you have to be careful that you're making valid queries and how do you deal with invalid queries. Good, and all of this is contained in PP. The one other thing you might wonder is that, you know, it's long been known, um, that BPP is contained in pH, but in general it's believed that BQP is not in pH. Okay, so Scott Aronson um, was interested in this a long time. Uh, he had this problem for relation, I believe. And finally, uh, Razental used a, a small variation on that to show an oracle separation between these classes. Okay, so I'll make of that what you will, but you know, it's going to be difficult to put it uh, into this hierarchy. Yeah? What is pH? Oh, oh, pH, sorry, is the polynomial hierarchy. 
So it's like, um, instead of having there exists a proof such that some predicate holds, you have there exists a proof such that for all settings of a second proof, there exists a third proof, et cetera, so that some predicate holds. This is the idea. So it doesn't matter how many constant times you, um, how many constant number of proofs you have in this um, setup, it's not believed you can verify BQP here anymore. And intuitively the reason why, and this comes up everywhere, including in like uh, quantum advantage works like um, boson sampling is, unlike the classical setting where a randomized Turing machine can always be thought of as a deterministic Turing machine that gets fed a random string, quantumly we do not know, and nor do we believe that you can separate the randomness out of the machine. Somehow it's inherently in the machine. Okay, so, so that's why a lot of these arguments break down. Good, and in fact, all of like the Scott Aronson's um, and Alex Arkhipov's work on boson sampling, the, the hardness results really use that property. Like without that, you don't get the hardness results. Good, I think that's all I wanna say about BQP and QMA, any questions? Excellent. All right, so uh, with that said, let me kind of go through as a pedagogical review this so-called quantum cook levin theorem for QMA. And um, you know, the, the tools you see here, they might well show up in some of the later talks. Like these history state constructions are used in a lot of these other um, results in quantum complexity theory. Okay, so I told you that this equation was gonna come back to haunt you, so here it is. I did not in uh, include it at the beginning for fun. I hate physics just as much as you do. Um, but uh, it's gonna be important because our whole discussion now is gonna revolve around these so-called Hamiltonians H, okay? Um, and in physics in general, you know, this is driving the evolution of my system. So of course I wanna know what are the properties of this operator H. They're gonna tell me all sorts of things like the eigenvalues will be the energy levels of my system, uh, the corresponding eigen, eigen um, vectors will be the states at those energy levels and so forth, okay? So on a the theoretical side, we need to understand the, the eigen decomposition of these operators. Good. Um, but the first question we'll ask is, you know, this is a very general equation, right? And this gives rise to arbitrary unitaries. And you might imagine that in practice, or in nature, you don't see arbitrary unitaries, right? That seems like quite overkill. And indeed, um, you should ask, what actually happens in nature? What class of Hamiltonians do we see? And the short answer is that, um, just like in the Cook-Levin theorem, where, you know, one of the main lessons that comes out of this is that computation is inherently local, right? You, you modify a small number of bits at a time. Nature also works this way. Okay, it's governed by local constraints. So this is what we get in nature. Okay, at least most if not all experimental setups. Um, so an n qubit um, Hamiltonian operator, H, this is some giant operator, right? It's acting on n qubits, so it's two to the power n by two to the power n. But the point is that it has a succinct description. Okay, I'm not writing out the full matrix. I'm writing it as a sum of baby matrices. Okay, each of these is acts on k qubits at a time. And that means that it's constant size. Okay, um, and you should think of this as a quantum constraint, just like with a classical CSP, this is a quantum constraint. Okay, so I, I write my system like this. I'll give you an example in a second, of course. And like I said, the, the spectrum of this operator is gonna be very important. Uh, the one we care about most, well, I shouldn't say that, but like things like quantum chemists really care about uh, the smallest eigenvalue of this operator. And the reason why is because, you know, if you take your system to essentially absolute zero, eventually your system will cool down into its lowest energy configuration, and that is called the ground state energy. Okay, and the corresponding eigenvector at that level, right, is the so-called ground state. Okay, so any questions about this definition? If you don't get this definition, the rest of the talk will make zero sense. Good, so what you, well, okay. The question is can we compare ground state with a, a classical constraint? What I can tell you is that you can certainly embed classical CSPs into this problem, and then the ground states uh, without loss of generality will just be strings, or encode strings basically. But I'm not sure if that answers the question you were asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a strict generalization of classical CSPs. Um, so what I'm leaving out of this, I'll, I'll give you an example now, but I do have to make the dimensions match now because this is constant dimension, whereas this is like bloody big dimension, right? So I'll show you, there's a tensor identity hiding in the notation, good catch. Yeah. Oh, 
Okay, we call it a constraint because we're, you know, we're, I'm trying to make you comfortable um, coming from a classical CSP background that, you know, you should think of this as a quantum analog of a constraint. Um, but more generally, the idea is that you're trying to minimize your energy or your overlap with each of these constraints so that you'll be the smallest eigenvalue. So imagine in an ideal world, um, the ground state will be orthogonal to all of these. Like, let's say these are all positive semi-definite, they have some null space. You want to be kind of in, in the null space of all the operators. Yeah. Good. So in that sense, it's a local constraint. Yeah. Good. So you're seeing what happens if the ground space is basically degenerate, right? Like you could have more than one, and that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, you cool down to something in that space. So there's some span of lowest energy eigenvectors, and you you'll be something in there. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Excellent questions. Okay. So let me give you a more explicit example, just so you have something to play with. So this is just an example on a line, right? I've got four qubits on a line. Um, so qubits one, two, three, four. Uh, these are the operators, like the local constraints. The first one acts on qubits one and two. The second one acts on qubits one and three, and so forth. So just like for a classical CSP. And so for example, maybe my four qubit constraint looks like this. You know, I put poly x tensor poly j, um, sorry, uh, xj plus yi tensor yj, and so forth. Um, this is a very um, well-known model in um, quantum magnetism, basically. This is the so-called Heisenberg antiferromagnet, magnet, for example. And you could write down this Hamiltonian. Formally, if I write out the full Hamiltonian, it looks like this. So this is to answer the question about the identities. Um, if I have a constraint on the first two qubits, you know, to fill up the space so that I have the right dimension, I have to tensor with an identity on the second two qubits. And likewise here, um, I need to put a tensor on the first and the fourth qubit identity here. Good. So my whole operator, it's four qubits, so it'll be two to the power four. Okay, so that's a local Hamiltonian. So um, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be the canonical QMA complete problem, quantum sat. It's not quantum sat, there's a version of quantum sat too. Um, so now let me have some fun with you guys and show you why you should care about this. I told you about ground state energies, but um, I think when you see it with your own eyes, it's a bit more interesting. So the only question is how do I go to uh, YouTube? Ah, there it is, okay. How many people have seen this video before? Really? Come on. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particularly is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. Okay, so that's an example of why we care about the low temperature regime, why we care about ground states, right? You're interested in harnessing these phenomena like superconductivity, superfluidity. It's expensive to run these experiments. You don't just take your system and put it in a refrigerator, right? I mean, you need a very carefully calibrated system of, say, lasers to really cool your exact uh, material down. Um, I do want to make the standard disclaimer as a computer scientist when I study this problem. You know, I'm not claiming that I'm solving problems about superfluidity, let's say, but that's the general generalization we're studying, right? Yeah, go ahead. 
I'm sorry? Oh, good. How is the input given? Yeah, good. So you're given um, this, this local Hamiltonian H. It's, you just give the, the local terms. Okay? Uh, maybe they're specified with poly and bits of precision or, okay, let's say constant bits of precision because that's more realistic in, in the lab, right? Yeah. So, uh, is there like a middle of the of the decomposition or...? No, 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 no. Okay. So these decompositions are not necessarily unique in any sense. Yeah. And like sometimes if you can find certain decompositions which are better, like uh, there's one decomposition called a stochastic Hamiltonian. If you could write your Hamiltonian that way, then it turns out you can do things like ground state simulation efficiently, actually. So, and finding that decomposition can actually be NP-hard under certain restrictions. So that's, that itself is a non-trivial problem, right? All of this, by the way, is an approximation to the real world, right? I mean, it's not like uh, a physicist woke up one day and said, ah, to model my superfluid system, you know, this is the local Hamiltonian, right? It doesn't work that way, right? Like, you have some system in the lab, you make lots of measurements, you care about some small number of properties, and eventually you, you settle upon a model that seems to predict most of the experimental results you're getting, and that's an approximation to real life, right? So all this is highly theoretical, like we've taken a step back and made it abstract. Good, any other questions? Okay, okay so let me briefly tell you about some uh, selected history uh, here, and you know, what are some of the surprises that have come up along the way, okay? Um, so the original work on this was by Kitaev based on some old ideas of Richard Feynman, and um, there he showed that the five local Hamiltonian problem is QMA complete, meaning five body interactions. Um, eventually it was shown that two local Hamiltonian is still QMA complete, and, and the, the main point of this work is that it introduced this new framework of so-called perturbation theory gadgets. And once the community had these, then you could do all sorts of cool stuff. You can show that even if your system is on a um, square lattice of qubits, you still get hardness. And the reason why we care about this is because physicists care about these types of systems. Um, and then the really crazy stuff starts to happen. Okay, classically, if I have a 1D SAT problem, it's always solvable in polynomial time. You can use dynamic programming or some sort of divide and conquer. Quantumly, this is not true. If I have a 1D system for high enough local dimension, um, it's actually still QMA hard. Okay? And then uh, you take a step further, and this is where uh, Sandy is involved in, right? That if you can do these crazy things, like not only is this thing on the line, but every constraint is completely identical. The only input parameter is the size of the bloody chain. It's still hard, okay? Um, it's in fact, you know, the, you get a blow up in complexity simply because for these systems, the only input is the size of the chain. So the input is exponentially smaller than the size of your system. So that's a bit of an artificial thing, but the point is it's still hard, right? That's really cool. Good, and then uh, you might ask whether we have these sorts of like um, Schaefer's dichotomy theorems, and we do. Uh, this is the only one we have as far as I'm aware. Um, and so you see the usual culprits, P and NP complete, you see QMA complete, and what we don't know what to do with is this funny class stochastic MA. I'll tell you a bit about that later, but the point is that this thing is not expected to even contain BQP. Uh, it's, it's in the polynomial hierarchy, unlike BQP. Good, and let me tell you about uh, the local Hamiltonian problem itself now, a, a bit more, like if you play with the precision parameters, right? We said you want one over poly error, that gives you Q, QMA completeness, if you ask for exponential error, like really high precision, now the, the complexity jumps up to P space. I think that's a relatively recent result. And you might ask, okay, let's go to the other extreme. What happens when we want constant precision? And this is where, you know, we daydream and we imagine, ah, if only I had a quantum PCP theorem, right? Because that's really the regime of the quantum PCP conjecture. Um, so this is a survey. I mean, it's probably a bit outdated by now, but, it, uh, you know, these are all excellent authors, so I'm sure it was very well written, okay? A good place to start. Good. Questions about the slide? It's just history. Yeah. No. Good. So in 1D, um, I think 12 was the original result. I think Daniel Nagai found an error in that. It was actually 13, but then later on, I think Daniel and Daniel brought it down to 11. So I, th it's 11, I think, or maybe it's 8 now. It's something like that. It's not lower than 8. We have no idea what happens. Like we don't even know how to solve. Um, standard two local Hamiltonian on the line unless you have an additional gap assumption on the spectrum. And even solving that was like a breakthrough. Oh. Okay, to the physicists it was long since solved because they had heuristics that worked very well. Um, but to computer scientists it was only solved recently formally in a, with a polytime algorithm. No. So the answer is no, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, what is 1D? Oh, 1D just means like in this example I had earlier where everything, this, this is absolutely the right question to ask. Good. Um, it's on a chain. All the constraints look like this. 
So you only have nearest neighbor interactions. Yeah. Should have a prize for you. You're asking like great questions. Okay, good. So let me tell you a bit about this uh, quantum Coke Levin theorem. Um, how does this work basically? So the goal here is that I have some um, unitary U, right? I'm, I'm trying to reduce all of um, QMA to the an instance of this local Hamiltonian problem, right? Uh, sorry, this is a typo. I've clearly stolen this from another presentation, and I forgot to remove the G. Um, but basically, you know, I have some verifier U, and I want to reduce it to an instance of a local Hamiltonian, uh, so that you know, if the verifier U accepts its input and the proof psi, again, that's a typo, um, then my Hamiltonian should have low energy. Okay, the ground, the smallest eigenvalue should be small, and if we reject the proof in the input, then the, my smallest eigenvalue should be large. It should be at least beta. That's the goal. Okay, so let's. First, take my circuit and just expand it out into a sequence of small two qubit gates, right? I mean, that's the, the framework we're working in. And this is supposed to verify some proof, psi proof. And so before we get into any details, what is the goal, right? So how many people here are familiar with the Cook Levin construction? Yeah, good. So in that construction, right, you have this tableau, right, that writes down all the steps of the computation, right? Quantumly, we can't really do this. And part of the reason is because if I give you an arbitrary proof, um, psi proof, you have no way of kind of locally checking that, you know, from one line of the tableau to the next, you know, uh, the state wasn't changed, let's say. Um, you can't do it with local checks, okay? So the way you get around this is by this brilliant idea, which really dates back in some sense to Feynman, which is that you encode your computation not as lines of a tableau, but actually in superposition, okay? And what's the idea? I mean, let's just stare at this for a second. I have a sum over all the time steps, t, and in the very first time step where no gates are applied, um, what's sitting in my registers are the proof, and scylla, and we, here we have a separate clock register that tags the time. Okay, that's very important. Okay, so I have an equal superposition over all technically n plus one time steps. That's the history state. That's gonna be very important for the rest of this discussion and probably in some of the later talks as well. So any questions about this slide? This is the key idea. We're trying to force the ground state to look like this. Just like with Cook-Levin, you want to force the solution to look like a properly filled out tableau. Um, which one? T. T. Sorry, T is a, the, 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 oh, this one. Yeah, yeah, that's a pure state. Yeah, yeah, good. The whole thing is in, in a pure state. Okay, good. So this is what we're aiming for, and how are we going to do it? Well, think back to Cook-Levin, right? The obvious thing to do is we had separate sets of constraints, like one that made sure in the beginning of the computation we were initialized correctly, at the end of the computation, we accept, okay, and, and each line of the tableau follows from the previous one, right? And via local checks, that's the key point. So we were gonna try and mimic that. So just like for Cook 11, we're gonna have um, a bunch of kind of terms that plays each of these roles. Um, the first one is this input Hamiltonian, and this is, you wanna check that the ancillas at time t equals zero are all correctly initialized to all zeros, okay? Um, and I'll write down what this operator looks like in a second, but the point is that whenever you give it a history state, this one, at time step t equals zero, this is indeed initialized to all zeros, because there's no gates here, and so you should completely annihilate this constraint. You're perfectly satisfying it. On the, the second thing you want is that if you start in the right place, then, well, going to the next step is done correctly, right, according to the circuit. We're trying to simulate the evolution of our verifier. So at time t, we want to apply gate ut, and you know, we'll design this in such a way that, again, the history state will perfectly satisfy this. Okay, I haven't told you, of course, what the operators look like just yet. Um, I'm gonna skip this, uh, this one here. This is just for the clock. Um, and then the last one you need is basically at time step t, of course, we want to accept. And here we can't perfectly um, satisfy things in general simply because QMA um, may not have perfect completeness. We don't know how to get perfect completeness in general. And so you'll have some frustration in general. But the goal is that the way we'll design this, the, the expectation you'll get here will scale basically like one minus the probability of accepting uh, your input and your proof, okay? Good, so let me show you what these operators look like. H in just looks like this. Basically what it says is here, where should you focus? First thing is uh, clock register, right? Time t equals zero. At time t equals zero, this state should be in the, the null space of this operator. This is identity minus all zeros. So you can only annihilate this by setting this register to all zeros. That's exactly what we want. 
and h out. Let's start by the clock register at time step m, the very last one. We want to basically penalize you if you don't have a one here. If you're, if you're not an accepting computation, I need you to have some overlap with this projector. And that's why there's a, a zero here. Um, so any questions so far? This is the basic setup. What was, sorry? Yes. This one, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just the identity operator on it. Good, thank you. No. Okay, and um, so how do we check time propagation? That's, that's the one that's kind of the hardest, right? These are, in retrospect, these are pretty simple, like once you're used to working with this stuff, of course. But the trickiest part is how do you check that the right gates get supplied at the right time? Because that's where we can't just apply this usual Tableau idea. Good, so let me show you how this propagation term is done. Okay, so the goal is again that we wanna define a propagation Hamiltonian so that um, if ut is applied at time t, we annihilate uh, that term. And this is the operator that turns out to work. Okay, if you haven't seen it, it'll probably be very mysterious. You know, once you play with it five, 10, 20 times, eventually you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So what is this intuitively trying to say? I mean, just focus on the red part. This basically says the following, right? That if I'm at time step t minus one and I jump to time step t, well then, in that case, I should apply the operator ut. That's the next gate. But to make things um, Hermitian and more generally symmetric, right, this alone is not a symmetric operator, right? I mean, look at this thing here. So you need to add the Hermitian conjugate of this. And this just says that if I go backwards in time from t back to t minus one, then I have to apply the inverse of that gate. Okay, everything's unitary. These terms are not strictly speaking necessary. They just make the whole thing positive. Okay, now you might still be staring at this and wondering what the hell it's doing. Um, that was like me as a grad student for many years. Um, so let's get a sense of why this might work, right? So our full propagation Hamiltonian is the sum of these terms, right? Each of these is for a single time step t, so we'll add them all together. And what happens then is that um, in the analysis, what's really cute is that you can actually run a change of basis and what this change of basis will do is it'll flush out all these actual u's. It'll switch them all to identity. There is a unitary that will do this for you. So in other words, you can, under an appropriate change of basis, you can make this computation look like the identity computation, like nothing happens at each time step. And when you do that, um, this Hamiltonian looks like this operator here. It looks like identity on the first two registers. And on the clock register, you get this funny tridiagonal thing. And this is essentially like a, a 1D random walk matrix. Okay, if you, I mean, you have to renormalize, right? But this is the idea. And it's a 1D random walk matrix. These things have been very well studied. Uh, we know exactly what the, the eigenvalues are. And in particular, the unique null state of this is exactly what we want. It's an equal superposition over all the time steps. We want to force our computation to have all the time steps in it, right? And so this is intuitively why this works. Okay, under change of basis, this comes out here. Okay, any questions? I don't know, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, so um, let's just quickly go through the analysis. I, I mean, I won't go into super depth, of course, but just to give you the idea. Okay, so now we have all our terms. Right? And so what do we get when we look at the expectation of the history state? This is in the yes case where there's a good history state because there's a good proof. Then we know that the history state annihilates the first three terms. And on the last one, we get this term. But it's a yes case, right? So with a good proof, you know, this probability of acceptance will be very high, very close to one. So this whole thing will be very small intuitively. Okay, and now the hard part is the, the soundness, right? I want to show that no matter what proof you give me, um, you're going to have a large energy. And in particular, what that means is that linear algebraically, I need to show that the smallest eigenvalue of this thing is going to be large in the no case. Good. How do we do this? Well, um, the problem here is that normally if all these operators were to pairwise commute with each other, then they diagonalize in a common basis, and you can just kind of add the eigenvalues appropriately. It would be very easy. You know, but life, unfortunately, is not easy. And the problem is that these two Hamiltonians, they pairwise commute, but they don't jointly commute with the, sorry, the input and the output commute, but they don't commute with the propagation Hamiltonian. That's the trick. So somehow we need some way of dealing with this, right? They, there's no common eigenbasis. 
And so there is a very nice tool that Kitaev introduces, and I won't prove it, but I'll state it, because even if you don't care about quantum, it's a nice tool to have on your toolkit. Okay? And so this is what he defined. He called this uh, the geometric lemma, basically. And what this basically says is the following. So I have two operators. They're non-negative. What I want to do is I want to understand is I want a lower bound on their joint smallest eigenvalues. Okay? And so somehow, I mean, think about it this way. If, um, if these two operators shared a common null space, I mean, sorry, a common null vector, right, then the joint, and this lambda min would be zero because there's a common state that takes both to zero, right? But now, in general, we can't assume that if they don't commute. And so somehow you should believe that what's going to dictate the scaling of that smallest eigenvalue is going to be, well, if I take two null states from both operators, you know, what's their overlap in some sense? Like, are they going to be very far apart or very close, right? And that's exactly what this is trying to quantify. This says that this should depend on the overlap between the null spaces of the first operator and the second, OK? So if you have two vectors that are really, really close in the null spaces, then somehow you should be able to annihilate most of this thing, right? And the other thing, of course, we need is we need to have a, non a bound on the non-zero eigenvalues of these two operators. That's this funny thing, B. Okay, that's it. And so for us, basically, so first, any questions about this geometric lemma? Just a statement. I'm not going to prove it. So the question is geometrically, is there some reason why it depends quadratically? Off the top of my head, um, I mean, the answer is almost certainly yes, but I, I don't know it. Let's say. I don't know if, Sandy, you have a better intuition than I do. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Is it tight? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, the scaling this will give you, I think, in, at least in our applications, is like 1 over the number of time steps cubed, like in the promise gap. And I believe James Watson did a very nice uh, work recently that tries to analyze if you could do better. I think he showed it was either tight or the best you could do is 1 over L squared. But um, so that, that's a work I can refer you to. But you can't like do much better, let's say. Than that. Yeah. And in fact, um, you could ask, I mean, it's kind of annoying that, um, well, OK, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Is the square coming from some half angle formula? I have a feeling you're probably right. Yeah. I mean, the, the proof of this is not difficult. It's just like linear algebra, you just play with things, right? I mean, uh, there's no magic kind of in some sense, yeah. So I imagine that's probably where it's coming from. Yeah. It's just like the monotonous between these k1s and k2s. So if that cosine thing says that it's x and y are expanded, then this thing uh, only gets uh, la uh, larger, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, you're saying that if, um, well, OK, as the angle between the spaces increases, then you should be better able to jointly satisfy both operators, right? right? So the null space of Yeah, generically you would expect exactly that, yeah, this generically. This makes it, sorry? Yeah, I, would, I think so, yeah. Good, so I mean, this has nothing to do with quantum, right? Anytime you want to bound the lowest eigenvalues, you should remember Kitaev, okay? In your dreams, Kitayev. OK, good. So that's all I want to say about this thing. And we can move to the, the last phase. Um, and so now let me tell you a bit about what happens beyond QMA. OK, so I think the later talks are mainly going to focus on things like interactive proofs. So I'll try not to uh, go through that stuff. I'll, I'll tell you about something probably that they won't cover, which is uh, the following. Um, there is not one definition of quantum MP. We haven't agreed on this. OK, what is the right definition of quantum MP? The one I've told you about is kind of the, the classic one that um, we take as a de facto standard, but it's not the only one. So the real situation is not like this. Uh, it's more like this. Okay. I tried to find a cuter picture than a bunch of mice, but this is what you get. Okay. All right. So um, there are, in fact, many definitions of quantum MP, and I like naming these after Snow White's dwarves because each of them has a personality. Right? I mean, so I told you about QMA. This is kind of, well, how many people know what the names of the seven dwarves are, by the way? Can anybody rattle them all off? I was on a plane trying to remember them all because I wanted to name these classes. And I, I couldn't remember the last one. I forget what it was again. I think it was, no, Sleepy. I think I forgot Sleepy. OK, anyway. So I told you about Doc because that's a straight shooter, right? This is QMA, the boss. Um, 
There's QMA1, which is what I'll call bashful, um, and this is because this is QMA with perfect completeness, okay? He's very timid and shy. He only jumps into a situation when things are perfectly ready, okay? Um, so that's QMA1. There's happy. Um, that's QCMA, and this is like, okay, QMA with a classical proof, right? Like, oh, you give me a quantum proof, you give me a classical proof, doesn't matter, I'm happy, okay? Um, easy going. Then there's grumpy, uh, QMA2, and this guy is grumpy because... Um, Nobody knows what to do with this class, right? It's very difficult to study. Here the proofs are so-called unentangled. You're guaranteed that it can be split in the middle between the tensor product of two spaces. There's sneezy um, because this is a very, it's not really a very robust class. Uh, here you're accepting with strictly positive probability. Um, and the last one is dopey. This is the stochastic MA, and while it's dopey because, I mean, look at its definition, right? I mean, um, it's a very restricted class. It's not even believed to contain BQP. But it still seems to be important. It shows up in these, um, for Cotomy theorem, okay? Good, so these are the classes, and in the rest of the time, you know, as I said, we'll see how far we get through. I wanna tell you about two of these, uh, QCMA and uh, QMA2, okay? Good, um, so this is just how everything fits together. Um, MP is contained in MA, which is known to have perfect completeness. That's contained in QCMA, which is also known to have perfect completeness. But here you'll notice that we don't know that QMA with or without perfect completeness is equal. This is still open. Okay. Uh, stochastic MA, as you can see, is under a completely different branch. This is Dopey over here. Uh, he's, I don't know what he's doing. Um, so he's in the polynomial hierarchy. Um, and so you'll notice that BQP is contained here, but it's not believed to be contained here. So it's weird to have a quantum version of MP that doesn't even contain quantum P, right? Okay, and then QMA is trivially contained in QMA2, also contained in PP, but here we have this really nasty state of affairs where the best upper bound we really have on this is, is next. It's really bad. So, uh, oh yeah, that should probably be there, yes. Yes, um, this should be there because this is essentially like QMA but with a very restricted verifier, yes, good catch. I think you've managed to make me look stupid, good. One point. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, good, so let me tell you about QCMA. So intuitively you might ask, okay, I have a quantum machine, I mean, I put all this effort into getting a quantum machine, why in the world are we still talking about classical proofs? Like what can this be possibly good for? And the answer is, you know, in general, that's a difficult question to answer, indeed. So here's my definition of QCMA. Well, not my definition, I mean the field's definition. Um, QCMA stands for quantum real Northern with a classical thrown in. And it's exactly the same definition. The only thing is that, of course, here we have a classical proof instead of a quantum proof. That's it. Okay? And there are a whole bunch of QCMA complete problems. You know, I, I will not really go through these. But if you kind of do take a, um, a skim through them, you'll, you'll notice that most of them are not really particularly natural, let's say. It's very hard to find good problems here, right? The most natural one is certainly this one, right? Does the Hamiltonian H, does it have, you know, some nice ground state that we can efficiently prepare with a circuit? Yeah. In this case, is there a distribution over Y as well in the sense that the proof would just sort of give you a randomized proof? Um, no, we're gonna, okay, well, um, without loss of generality, we can assume that, you know, the best proof strategy is pure state, which is gonna be a string in this case. That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. So you can imagine that this is a quantum uh, machine. What it does is it first measures its input. Even if you get a, give it a quantum state, it'll just measure it and then just read the string out. Good question. Okay, so this is QCMA. What I'm gonna tell you about is um, one particular place where actually a, a fairly natural problem does come out for QCMA that may give some insight as to why um, classical proofs can help. And this comes from the study of so-called reconfiguration problems for SAT. Oh, I don't know why those lines are not showing up. This is supposed to be a cube. On my screen, it looks like a cube, but okay, this is the hypercube, okay? There are two lines missing. Um, so reconfiguration problems, you know, this is a field started by Papa Dimitri and friends in around 2005, and now it's like a whole kind of sub-area, which I think Christos has a habit of doing, inventing sub-areas. Um, and how does this work? We've got uh, a Boolean formula phi, and you can imagine, you know, the solutions to this are just, you know, the red points on this hypercube, okay? So here there are four solutions to say my SAT formula. And we're interested in the, the geometric properties of uh, the solution space, this red induced subgraph. So in particular, we might ask, you know, is this space connected? If I give you two solutions, like here and here, let's say, is there some sequence of steps I can take on the hypercube going through, all, through the solution space, of course, so that I can get from here to here, okay? So in other words, is there some sequence of local bit fits so that, you know, I'm, I'm walking on the hypercube from X to Y? 
Good. So this is classical reconfiguration, and it's known, um, you know, since, oh, sorry, I guess the original is 2009. Uh, they showed a dichotomy theorem. It's either NP or P space complete. So why am I getting something harder than NP here? Any, any idea? This is a subtle point, but it's important. Why is this not an NP? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, right? So I can't just take the shortest route between these, right? If I take the shortest route, of course, that'll take only order n steps. That's an NP. But in the worst case, you know, I might need to take some really weird convoluted path to stay in the solution space. And that's why, in general, you're going to get this P space hardness. Okay, that's important. Good, so in general, an exponential number of steps are necessary. This is reconfiguration classically. And so it turns out we can consider a quantum analog of this. And the, the definition is just the direct generalization of the classical one. Okay, and this is going to give rise to a, you know, an arguably natural QCMA complete problem. So just like classically, instead of SAT, I've got quantum SAT and Hamiltonian. I give you an initial and a final kind of solution to this Hamiltonian, two ground states. They're specified by quantum circuits, okay? So I can't write down the states in general, so I'm going to represent them with circuits. And just like the classical case, what I want to know is the following. So number one, I want a sequence of gates um, from time one up to t. These are each, it's very important that we're talking about local gates. So just like on the hypercube, you can only make single bit flips at a time, right? We're going to use the same idea. Quantumly doing one qubit gates is not very interesting, so we have to allow at least two qubit gates so you can do universal quantum computation. So can you map the initial ground state to the final one? And of course, the key property is that throughout this evolution, every intermediate state should remain kind of in this low energy space, in the solution space. This is the idea. Okay, so any questions about the definition? Okay. Um, so what's the motivation here? The motivation here is something like, um, you can think about this in error correcting codes, right? I mean, imagine I had, let this be kind of my code space, okay? And here I've got a, some initial ground state and some final ground state. These are the kind of like code words in my space. And what this basically says is that, is there some sequence of, a small sequence of um, local operations? Typically, local operations correspond to local errors in some sense. So that I can kind of secretly map this state to the other one. And if I stay in the code space the whole time, then you know, if I measure the, co the code space operator, I won't detect that this transition is taking place. I'm still in the code space, technically. Okay? So if there was a short connection here, that would be kind of bad, say, for quantum memory or something like this. Okay, so that's one way to view this problem in terms of motivation. Okay, and so what do we know? This problem is uh, essentially QCMA complete. Um, one of the interesting th things that happens is that it's even hard, even if you have commuting local Hamiltonians, meaning the, the terms all pairwise commute. Sorry, was there a question? What did small mean? Oh, small just meant like, um, in our case, you could actually make it zero exactly if you want, or you know, one over poly close to that. And no case is one over poly above that, whatever that is. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I cannot read the red code. The red, oh, sorry. Uh, code words. These are supposed to be, so these are two code words in my space. Okay. And I want to know, can you secretly evolve one to the other with a short path while staying in the code space? Yeah. It's not your glasses. I can't read it from here. So, <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Why is it in QCMA? Oh, good. Because here, um, good. Um, what I did not, it depends how you phrase the exact formulation, right? So if I want to put it in QCMA, I will bound this to say, is there a sequence of a polynomial number of gates? And then you just give me that sequence of gates, basically. Then it's in QCMA. In general, of course, it's not. It can be p-space hard. Okay. So, good question. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't care about that. So, so, so they just. Um. Okay. Well, these are two qubit unitaries, right? So, I mean, they're constant size in some sense, right? Oh, the precision. Yeah, I mean, it, the precision doesn't really matter because I have a polynomial number of gates here, and you know, here, you know, I have I have a promise cap of one over poly, so I could always like truncate the entries at some poly bits of precision. That's more than good enough, right? I don't like to think about such problems. Uh, okay, like in the lab, I don't think physicists are going to say, "Oh, my Hamiltonians have you know." Poly and bits of precision. That's kind of silly, right? There's some constant precision that realistically they're going to use. But okay, very good point as a computer scientist. 
But so this problem is known to be hard even if the local operators all commute with each other. Um, this is not known for the local Hamiltonian problem, so this is our, already a big deviation point here. Um, it's hard even, again, um, just like Sandy's result for the, the local Hamiltonian problem, it's hard um, even on 1D translation variant systems. Okay? Um, and so one thing that's a bit surprising that we uh, realized uh, recently is that classically, um, you're on the hypercube, right? So the solution space can be either connected or disconnected, right? And that's what makes this hard to decide. Is it connected or not? Quantumly, they're always connected. Okay? And intuitively, you may expect this because it's sort of like a continuous space, right? Um, but the basic premise is this. So classically, like in this example, you know, this red subgraph is certainly disconnected. But what you can show quantumly is that, you know, if you take any two points on the hypersphere and you draw any sufficiently smooth path between them, you can always approximate that path with some set of two qubit gates. Okay, the important thing is the locality, right? If I allow arbitrary unitaries, of course I could do this mapping. But the point is, how do you do it with two local gates? Because that's what we do on quantum computers, right? So you can always approximate this path um, exponentially closely. The trade-off is that, um, so here you go, I can pick kind of two um, start and end points. In our case, like for GSCon, it will be uh, ground states, right? And I can pick some path between them, and I can always simulate that path with the local gates, and I can do it with, you know, an exponentially small error. Okay, so really, really close. So I'll be always be very, very close to this ground space. I'll never really leave it. Um, the trade-off, of course, is that the number of steps you need to take is going to blow up too. That's also going to be exponential. Okay? So intuitively, what this says is that for error correction, it says that in principle, any correction, error correction code can be fooled if you wait long enough for an error process to take an exponential number of steps. Okay? In some sense, then, you know, throughout this evolution, I'm exponentially close to the ground space. If I do a single measurement, I'll never detect that this corruption was taking place. Okay? Of course, practically, this does not break error correcting codes. Let me be clear. Um, normally, you're measuring very frequently for these things. Good. Any questions here? Oh, um, I mean, I don't know. We didn't do it that way. I mean, we just basically, the, the way you do this is you, um, it's just going to be some Lipschitz continuous path, and then you basically discretize it, and then in theory you have um, small, technically each kind of discretized step will be a small rotation, um, but what's highly non-trivial here is that, um, I mean, we're using other people's work, let me be clear when I say this, um, that um, even if quantumly, let's suppose you want to do some rotation that's infinitesimally small, right, um, in degree, you might still need an exponential number of gates to do this. And the reason is because the rotation axis itself could be incredibly complicated, even if the angle itself is tiny. And so, um, so you need to break this uh, rotation down into like a, a small sequence of steps, basically, you know, and, and do it carefully. But that's intuitively also where this exponential blow-up comes out. So I don't know the answer to your question, but that's how we do it. Good. This is all I want to say about QCMA. So this is a problem where, you know, you get a sense of why classical proofs might help. They can guide you through some space. Good. And in the remaining time, which there's not much, you know, I'll just give you a sense of QMA2. Why is grumpy grumpy? Okay. So what's QMA2? QMA2 is this bad boy over here. Again, same thing as QMA, except now I have a tensor product proof. Okay. And um, the best we really know about this is like, you know, an upper bound of next, really. Okay, so that's pretty nasty, right? QMA was all the way down in PP, and this, this one's next, what, right? Um, so, you know, it's been like 20 years since this class has been defined, kind of what's the holdup, right? Why are we so bad at understanding this? Like, normally, tensor product is good, right? It means that I have less entanglement. The state is, like, simpler, right? Why is it harder to understand the power of this class? So let me try and do that on this slide. So here's really the underlying reason, at least informally, right? This should give you the intuition. For both classes, if I have some operator and I give it some proof, the probability that this uh, verifier will accept the proof, and this is, you know, let's not worry about what class it's coming from, it corresponds to this nasty expression here, right? I have my initial proof, my initial ancillas, I apply my verifier, and then I project down onto the accepting subspace one. Okay, so that's that probability. And what you can do is using the cyclicity of the trace, you can kind of move things around so that what you see in red is the only variable in this. Everything else is fixed. I could pull out the red part, the proof, 
And everything else is some fixed operator that just corresponds to my um, verifier. So I could rename this nasty thing um, the accepting so-called POVM. It's some positive operator. And so this probability is just you're trying to maximize this overlap between psi and this positive operator. Okay? Good. So um, what's the difference between QMA and QMA2 now? Well, in QMA, we're trying to optimize this over all unit vector psi. Okay? That's just the definition. And in QMA2, we're trying to optimize this over not unit vectors, but over the tensor product structure. Now, uh, what is this thing? What is the, what comes out of this as a quantity, a linear algebraic quantity? Why is that easy in some sense? It's an eigenvalue, right? It's just a top eigenvalue of M. Nice. I can solve this in time polynomial in the dimension of the matrix. What the hell is this, right? This is nothing nice, right? It's not like some nice interpretation. And indeed, um, what's known is that, of course, in the size of the dimension of the matrix, right, I can solve for eigenvalues in poly time. Um, solving this funny quadratic optimization is in general MP hard. Okay, in the, in the dimension, of course. In, for QMA2, I don't get to work in time polynomial in the dimension, but at least this should give you some flavor as to why this is harder, this is easier. Okay? Good. Any questions here? Okay, um, so let me tell you just about some quick results. Um, so why should you care about QMA2? Well, something kind of funny happened in 2007. It was realized that this funny unentanglement, one of the things that allows you to do is compress classical proofs. So give me a proof for NP. Normally it needs n bits. With QMA2, I can do it with a, a log size proof. The trade-off is that we, we have no idea how to, how to amplify this kind of while maintaining this proof size. Um, and then there's some works improving this. Um, eventually it was realized um, that if you have multiple provers, it equals to two provers, and that you can do weak error reduction. That was highly non-trivial. So this was kind of a breakthrough work by Harold Montanaro. Um, and we do have one complete problem for this class. It's some analog of the local Hamiltonian problem. What's very important here is that you can't talk about local Hamiltonians. You have to talk about sparse Hamiltonians now. Um, okay, so we don't know this, um, but the first thing, you know, we can ask, and I obviously will not have time to really get into this, but I'll try and go through it. I'll just state the key points. Um, why does unentanglement help compress proofs? Right, I mean, when I read these proofs, I, I'm always a bit confused. Like, I understand the proof, but I don't get an intuition out of it. Yeah. Um, well, the, the exact statement is that NP equals to QMA2 with number one, a log size proof, number two, a log, size, a log space verifier. So that's the exact characterization. For QMA, well, that, that's an equality, right? Yeah, so now if you put MA instead of NP, well, um, maybe if you relax the verifier to be not log space, maybe. I haven't thought about it, but potentially. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just tell you br very briefly about the story. So it requires a detour to the land of NP space. Okay, so we all know Savage's theorem, right? P space equals NP space. Magic, right? Um, and then um, there were some various works here that tried to do the same thing quantumly, and you know, you do get equality like BQP space equals to, you know, uh, QMA space, if you will. Um, but you know, the catch here in these works, uh, though very nice works, is that for uh, quantum NP space, they only consider a poly size quantum proof. And of course, in general, NP space requires an exponential size proof, okay? And so you can go ahead and define an appropriate notion of quantum NP space. I certainly won't have time to go through it. Um, the basic idea is that, you know, for NP space, you're gonna have an exponentially long proof, right? If you actually were to think in the proof view. So, and the, the prover, the verifier, of course, cannot write down this bloody thing, it's way too long. So one way to formalize it is via streaming. And so we have some model for doing this. And when you, Consider this version of QCMA, um, quantum MP space. You don't get P space. You break Savage's theorem. You get maximum. Okay? And, I mean, the one, what I want to really focus on is that you can, it turns out you can take these exponentially long proofs and compress them kind of systematically down into poly size history states. Okay? And I will not go through the construction. I mean, uh, it goes through these propagation Hamiltonians again. Um, but it uses them in a QMA2 fashion. Yeah. 
Um, and what's really kind of neat here is that it turns out that once you have unentanglement, you can kind of predict the future in some sense. You don't need to know all your gates in advance in your circuit. You can still come up with a Hamiltonian that'll um, still correctly track whatever gates you choose to apply in the future. And intuitively, this is going to go via this tensor product, right? And what does this buy us? Um, I'm going to jump through it. Is uh, the fact that we have a tensor product here, it allows us to logically simulate at a higher level um, quadratic Boolean functions. Okay, and this you can't do if you don't have the tensor product, right? And so, um, so for example, in this work, what we can do is we can use this un unentanglement to simulate the equals function between the two separate proof spaces. Okay, this is something you can't do unless you have that tensor product requirement. So in some sense, this is kind of what's, what entanglement is allowing you to do. It allows you to simulate now quadratic functions logically. Good, but again, uh, it's 1016, so let me stop. Uh, Okay, so here's basically the summary. I won't go through the summary again. Here's some very quick open questions. Um, quantum PCP theorem. Obviously, we don't know if it holds or not. Many, many serious efforts so far. Um, we don't even know how to resolve this so-called NLTS conjecture. We don't have a quantum analog of the valiant Vazirani theorem. Like, can you um, reduce the number of solutions to one on average, like with a random reduction? We don't know whether um, perfect completeness holds for QMA. And of course, um, we don't know the exact complexity of QMA2, but we can say that you know, um, there is an oracle separation between Cohen P and QMA2. Okay, so um, that's an obstruction. Good, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Ev. Great talk. Uh, we have time for like a few quick questions, and then we have a quick break. Oh, uh, so the question is, do I have any state-of-the-art reading? So, okay, what are you looking for is the question. So you want like complexity theory or? Okay, yeah. Um, so generally speaking, um, of course, Nielsen and Trang is kind of the Bible, but that's a bit outdated and that gives you the basics. Um, I'm gonna do something faux pas, which is I'm gonna direct you to my course notes on quantum complexity theory. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, I really took a lot of effort to polish those. Um, the other person who has uh, course notes, of course, is Scott Aronson. You should certainly look at those as well. But I'm not really aware otherwise of like a, a set of notes that I could kind of freely open access refer you to. And, and that's the other reason why I refer you to mine, but of course, I'm biased. And More by questions. the way, there are like videos for that on YouTube too, like so. One more question. On one, sl on one slide you had the uh, sigma, Q sigma three. Uh, what is it about? A kind of third, third level, some. Good, yeah, so on one slide there is this, uh, Q sigma three, and, and this is literally, yeah, a quantum analog of the polynomial hierarchy that we defined a few years ago. And you can shove that third level of this hierarchy where you get, they're quantum proofs, but they're mixed states. You're not allowed to get rid of that mixedness due to, you don't have convexity anymore because you have alternating quantifiers. It's a min-max problem now. Um, and that's, that class goes between QMA2 and NEXP. And so, you know, if QMA2 were to equal NEXP, then you should essentially be able to get rid of the universal quantifier. It exists for all exists. QMA2 is exists, exists, and so if QMA2 equals next, you should be able to get rid of that middle for all quantifier. Yeah, and whether you believe that should be possible or not, you know, that's wide open. And so you, uh, they, it's not really clear where P space is then in between both of them? Oh yeah, so we have no idea uh, whether QMA2 contains P space, but like I said, there's an oracle separation uh, between co and P and QMA2 already, right? So. Anything you do has got to be non-relativized. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Sev again. So when there's now a coffee break. We resume at 10.45.